friends, I am Nikhat Parvin Khan. Welcome you all in this FTL series on the Competition Community's YouTube channel. So, CGPSC Prelims 2020 is all set to knock the doors of your knowledge and wisdom. So, you all now need to pull up your socks to nail it down. And we are here to guide you to do so. In this FTS series, we'll be providing you with important objective questions of all the subjects, probably all the subjects which are there mentioned in the syllabus of CGPSC prelims. May it be any subject of India's GS or it be any subject of Chhattisgarh GS or may it be the paper to CSET and language. We are coming with the important objective questions of all the subjects of PSC prelims. Fine. Well, many of you know what FTR is. That's where also we had brought this session of FTR and we've got a lot of appreciation and love from you all. And we just hope that this FTR session would have benefited you all in the exams. Uh, tell me in the comment section that how many of you have already attended the series of FTR which we brought last year and how it helped you in your preparation and how it helped you in your exams. Fine, for those who are new, uh, for them, I am actually telling this that FTI series mainly covers the objective questions, but it doesn't, it does not only cover the objective questions, it also covers the concepts behind those objectives. So, in this series, we won't be giving you many questions in one session. We'll be giving you approximately 10, 12, or 15 questions in one session, but we will be explaining each and every question in detail so that if any question related to that concept comes, you can solve that question also. So, although we are providing you in one session approximately 10 to 12 questions, but by listening to the explanation, by noting down to the explanation carefully, you will be able to solve about around all of the questions which could emerge from that topic. Fine with that. So, we will be dealing with lesser questions, but the explanation will be in a comprehensive manner. So that's all I wanted to discuss before actually starting the question answer session. I hope you got everything about the concept of this series and we will be providing two videos each day. Uh, today's is the first video of quality at 6 p.m. Tomorrow at 8 a.m. The FTR of Chhattisgarh GS will be available on our English medium YouTube channel. So. At evening 6 p.m. you will be given the India GS videos and at 8 a.m. morning you will be given the Chhattisgarh GS videos. So do not forget to watch any of these episodes because it's really going to help you in your preparation. So with that let us commence our today's session. Firstly you could see over here that I am firstly dealing with the session of quality. I'll take two subjects in this FTR. First will be the polity and second will be history. And from today, the session of polity will start and after some time, after the break, the session of history will start. You all have been provided with the schedule of this entire series in the description. Also, you will be given the PDF of all the questions which will be covered in all these sessions. So along with the video session, you also will be given the PDF of the questions which will be covered in this session. So go find the attachments, go find the links given in this description where you'll be getting the schedule as well as the link of the PDF of the questions. In that list, you could see that the first few topics which will be covered in the episode 1 of the FTR were these. Okay, I will read it out. If you haven't yet looked at the topics given the schedule, uh, here I have mentioned the topics. Constitutional development, schedules, parts, resources, making of constitution and preamble. Obviously, as you all have already studied what constitution is, you might be knowing these, these are the few initial topics of the constitution. While you start studying the constitution, you get to confront with these topics initially. So, in today's session, there will be 10 questions based on these topics. So, let us start with the session with question number one. Oh, it is a match the following question. Uh, on one side, you can see the name of the committees and on the other side in the second list you can see the names of the few chairmen of the committees and below is the options given out of which you have to choose one drafting committee rule of business committee house committee order of business committee and the name of chairmen are dr rajendra prasad dr b r ambedkar dr k m munchi and patabi sita ramaya 
So, from which section this question has been framed? Tell me now. This question has been framed from the topic of making of the constitution. Making of the constitution. You might be known this. To frame our constitution when constituent assembly was made and that constituent assembly was again divided into many major and minor committees. So, there were around 8 major committees and there were around 13 minor committees. From this section of the committees, one question always comes, it frequently comes and that is the name of the chairman of these committees. One need to remember the names of all the committees along with the chairman of that respective committee. Earlier, we only used to memorize the eight major committees because those were the important ones. But now, as you all know, in constitution, the questions come from very depth of the topic. So now it won't suffice. If you only go for eight major committees, it won't suffice. You also need to know the names of the chairman of minor committees as well. See, the question over here not only covers the major committees, two of the committees mentioned here are major committees while two are minor committees. So, firstly, you need to memorize this list, 8 major and 13 minor committees, right, along with the name of the chairman. So, I had, to, I had told you the section from where the question has been framed. Let's move on to the analysis of the question and what the answer will be. Drafting committee. Who was the chairman of draft, drafting committee? It was Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar. Rule of business committee. Who was its chairman? It was Dr. Rajendra Prasad. House committee. Who was its chairman? Patabi Sita Ramaya. And order of business committee's chairman was Dr. K. M. Munshi. So, if we look at the options, for A, it's 2. For B, it's 1. So, let us see the initial combinations. For A, it's 2. B, there is only one such option where for A, there is 2. So, if you only know for sure the chairman of the drafting committee, you could pick out what the correct answer is. In math, the following, this is the point of benefit which you get that if you only know one or two correctly, you can easily guess the correct answer of that question. So, it's very obvious that option number B is the correct answer because Drafting committee's chairman was, chairman was Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. Let's check out the other options as well. A2, B1, yes, B1, C4, C4, and D3. Okay, the entire combination is as per as we had analyzed. So, option B is the correct answer. Fine. So, as I said, you need to memorize the name of the chairman, and the best way to memorize is on one side, write down the name of the chairman. And on the other side, write down the name of all those committees for which they had been appointed the chairman. Like Dr. Rajan Prasad. Dr. Rajan Prasad was not only the chairman of rule of business committee. He was also the chairman of steering committee. So, despite writing in a way where you write more number of committees and repeatedly write the names of the chairman, write down the name of chairman and the multiple committees for which they had been appointed right write down dr rajin prasad and in front of that write down rule of business committee then steering committee similarly pandit jawaharlal nehru he was the chairman of three important major committees union constitution committee union powers committee and also the states committee so union constitution union powers states committees doesn't have to be dealt separately all were chaired by dr jawaharlal nehru so that is the way of memorizing this fact this comes in any type of question Right? Not only the match, the match, match the following, not only match the following, it could come in, identify the incorrect statement, identify the correct statement, or the direct question, who is the chairman of the steering committee, it could come in that way also. Fine with that. So, go with this fact in the section of making of the constitution. Now, let us move on to the section number, to the question number two. So, question number two, again, the actually the first three questions are of match the following all only but all the three initial questions belong to different sections which i had mentioned in the topic so it is also match the following but from a different section and this is from the section of constitutional development constitutional development and we all know under constitutional development we study the historical background of the constitution under which 
we study all the acts of the British era right from the Regulating Act 1773 till the uh, Independence of India Act 1947. So in that chapter, we study all the important acts and the provisions of those acts. During the British rule, few acts came to India and in those acts, many administrative changes were made for India and those acts were actually passed from the British Parliament. Fine. So this particular topic is not only important for polity, it is also important for history. While you'll be studying the modern history part, there also you'll be studying about more limited reforms, regulating acts, because there are many facts, there are many data, there are many incidents which are related to those important acts which came to India under British rule. So when you study this topic, two subjects will be covered. That is history and polity. Fine with that. So this question is from those series of acts only. On one side, provisions have been mentioned, and on the other side, the names of the act. You need to match that in which act, which provision came to India. So controller board. Controller board was formed in which act? It was made by the Pitts India Act. There are few spelling mistakes. It is double T. P I double T S Pitts apostrophe. Pitts India Act 1784. Because in 1784, through Pitts India Act, the East India Company was bifurcated into Board of Control and Board of Directors. Board of Control was made to manage the administrative affairs, whereas the Board of Directors was made to manage the financial affairs or the commercial affairs of the company so that it could manage both the wings properly. Fine. So, Board of Control is also known as Controller Board. In general, it is known as Controller Board. So, it came into existence by the Act 1784 Spits in the Act. Fine. Central Administration. It can be matched with Regulating Act 1773. Just because in Regulating Act 1773, the British East India Company was identified as the main administrator of India by the British government. British government gave the recognition of the administrator of India to the East India Company. And not only it recognized the company as India's administrator, the government over there also sent some regulations for the company so that it could rule in the country on behalf of the Britain's government. So that's why this act is known as Regulating Act. This act only laid down the central administration of British rule in India. Yes, you need to remember this point, I repeat, by the Regulating Act of 1773, the central administration of Britishers was laid down in India and the Governor of Bengal was renamed as the Governor General of Bengal, right? You need to remember this also. This fact, this part will be covered in history as well. So I'll be telling you only a few things here. The rest I'll be telling you in the history part. There were three to four such acts which renamed the names of the heads of the country in India. Like initially the head of the country was known as Governor of Bengal, Robert Clive, the first Governor of Bengal. Then through this Regulating Act of 1773, the name was again or the designation was changed from Governor of Bengal to Governor General of Bengal. Right? Then by the Act of 1833, the Bengal's Governor General's designation was changed to India's Governor General and by the Government of India Act of 1858, it was again changed to Viceroy of India. So this also happened because of the because of various reasons. Uh, let's not get into uh, that much detail now. So what I wanted to tell you here is through 1773's Regulating Act, a central administration's bedrock was laid down in India of British rule and therefore I chose this option for this match. Fine. Governor General of India, just I said that in place of the Governor General of Bengal, a new designation of Governor General of India came by the Act of 1833, the Charter Act of 1833. So the third point can be matched with D. Prior to this act, the head of the country was called as Governor General of Bengal. And through this act, this designation was changed to Governor General of India. Fine with that. And the last one is State Secretary of India. So obviously, there is only one option left and that is 
Indian Government Act 1858. Actually, by this 1858 Act, the entire power of administration of India got shifted from the hands of the company to the hands of the crown. By this act, the crown rule started in India. So, crown took over the direct administration of India and made a 15 membered body known as Indian Council which was headed by a post named, named as Secretary of India and this Secretary of India was a British parliamentarian who was assisted by a team of 15 members and those 15 people used to take all the important legislative decisions for India. Secretary of India was the head, right? So the legislative decisions which they took was sent to India and India the Viceroy and in India, the Viceroy used to execute those legislations, right? So by this Act of 1858, the post of Secretary of India was created along with the Indian Council. And these people used to frame the legislations for India. And then that was sent to India, which was further executed by the Viceroy. Fine. The creation of this post belongs to the Act of 1858. So in this way, we have got all the matches for A, it's 2, for B, it's 4, for C, it's 1 and for D, it's 3. So which is the correct answer? It's C. Option C is the correct answer. Fine with that. So not only uh, the provisions given over here, go through all the provisions right from the Regulating Act 1773 to the Independence of India Act 1947. Fine. So let us move on to the next question, question number three. Again, as I said, it is a match the following questions from the schedules of Indian Constitution. Schedules. We all know that there are 12 schedules at present in the Constitution. And initially, when the Constitution was commenced, there were eight schedules. And gradually, with few amendments, the number of schedules in the Constitution will increase from eight to Fine. So, what is given here is the number of the schedule and the subject matter which that schedule deals with. Right? So, these are the subject matters and this list names the number of the schedule. So, third schedule, ninth schedule, fourth and tenth. What's there in the third schedule? It's the draft of oath. Yes. If you had gone through the important schedules of the constitution, you might be knowing this, that the schedule 3 tells about the oath and the affirmations of the important constitutional posts, like the members of the legislative assembly, like the members of the parliaments. You all know that all these representatives take oath of their office. Right. So the text of the oath and all the important officers who all take oath, the constitutional officers who all take oath are being mentioned in schedule third only. So option A can be matched with option five of the second list. Coming to the ninth schedule, it is matched with the legalization of certain acts. Actually, as I said right now that initially there were only eight schedules. Now there are 12 schedules. The schedule ninth, 10th, 11th and 12th were later added by a few amendments. So from this we know that 9th schedule was also not a part of the initial constitution. It was later added. It was added by the first amendment 1951. This particular amendment deals with many land reform systems. Right. So it actually legalized many such systems which led to the land reforms in India. So by this amendment only, the ninth schedule was added, which is related to the land reform systems. So the option given here is not direct, but indirect. You need to use your wisdom and answer. Fine. So B will be three. Coming to the next fourth schedule. It's correct matching is separation of seats in upper house. It's actually not separation. It is mistakenly given here. It's allocation. If you know all the 12 schedules, you might be knowing this. The fourth schedule deals with the allocation of seats in the Rajya Sabha. We all know that Rajya Sabha, which is an indirectly elected house, uh, has the members from each state according to the population. Like if MPs from Chhattisgarh goes to Rajya Sabha, so the number of members from Chhattisgarh will be decided in accordance with the population of the Chhattisgarh. If few people from 
Uttar Pradesh will go to the Rajya Sabha. Then the total number of seats in Rajya Sabha from Uttar Pradesh will be decided in accordance in proportion to the total number of population in Uttar Pradesh. Fine with that. So it directly portrays that the higher is the population of the state, more will be the seats which comes from there in Rajya Sabha. So all these listings, all these classification, all this allocation according to the population is done, is mentioned in the fourth chapter. Fine with that. So allocation of seats in the Rajya Sabha. Coming to the fourth one, the tenth schedule, it deals with anti-defection law. Anti-defection law was again a later added schedule which was added by the 52nd amendment 1985 and this particular schedule deals with prohibition of changing of the parties while one gets elected as an MLA or MP. We know that whenever a person wins an election, he either contests the election individually without getting the ticket of any party. That means he's a non -part either he's a non-partisan candidate or if he belongs to a party, he needs to fulfill the norms of that party or he's a nominated member. Three types of member become an MLA or an MP. Fine with that. So this uh, anti defection law deals with few clauses of disqualification of these MLAs and MPs, whether it be the non-partisan MP, or the partisan MP or the nominated MP. Uh, like simply, I'll be telling you that if you had won any election belonging to any party, then throughout your term, you need to be a member of that party only. You cannot change the party once you get the post. Or else you'll be disqualified under this anti defection law. There are such many such provisions under anti defection law. I won't be dealing it in detail. So you only need to know that anti defection law which relates to the disqualification of MLAs or MPs if they change their party or are absent from the uh, voting of their house and all these things are mentioned in anti defection law which is mentioned in the 10th schedule. Fine with that? So we have matched all the schedules with the provisions. Which answer becomes the correct answer? Okay. For A it's 5th, for B it's 3, 5, 3. It is evident that option number D is the correct answer. 5, 3, 1, 2. Let's check. 5, 3, 1, 2. Yes. Option D is the correct answer. Fine. So not only these four, go through all the eight remaining schedules also. You are often asked the names of the parts and the names of the schedules in, in, in many formats of questions. Fine. Let us now move on to the question number four. The word sovereign means... The question is from which section? Sovereign word meaning is when asked. The question is from the section of preamble. Preamble. In the text of the preamble, a word is mentioned which is known, which is sovereign. And the question asks what this word actually means. Is it India is a dominion state or it is a country of equality of opportunity or the option C here is no obstacle in any kind of activities of people or it is it does not depend on any other country which will be the answer answer will be D it doesn't depend on any of the country actually when you go through the preamble of a constitution it mentions the nature of Indian state Nature of Indian states. And there are five such words which mention the nature of Indian state in preamble. One is sovereign, then it's socialist, then it's secular, democratic, republic. These five words tell about the political nature of a country and you are oftenly being asked in the questions the meaning of these words. You might have seen the questions related to democracy, you might have seen the questions related to republic. What does the word republic mean out of the given options choose the best possible, choose the best option. You might have seen such questions. So you need to know the meaning in short of all these words. Sovereign means. Okay, I'll be coming to sovereign at last. Firstly, I'll be telling the rest for in short. Socialist means socialism is directly related to the socialistic 
concept of equality of society equality in society actually so socialistic means a nation is socialistic if there is no discrimination amongst all the classes all the communities in a society and while government takes a decision there is no reflection of any higher middle or lower class in the government's decision with social equality there the country is socialistic so arts is a socialistic country right coming to secularism we all know what secularism is if a country while taking its administrative decision doesn't discriminate between uh, the communities between the religions between the castes and creed so if there is no discrimination in the basis of religion especially then that type of a country is known as a secular country so while taking administrative decisions if there is no religious discrimination then that is secularism if there is no, so if there is no class discrimination then that is socialism fine democracy we all know what democracy is it is a government of the people for the people and by the people demos means mass public and crazy means rule so if a country is ruled directly or indirectly by the people of that country then that country is known as a democracy like ours fine and the last word republic it is a very important concept i won't be getting into the detail i'll be telling in short here republic a country is known as a republic when the head of the state of that country is an elected post i repeat when head of the state is an elected post like in india the head of the state is president and we all know that president of india although not directly but yes indirectly he is elected so we all choose our president and the president can be any layman of the country to fulfill the basic requirements written in the constitution so any person from the country can become a president so he is the head of the state and he gets elected so any country wherein the head of state is not appointed nor is he nominated but he is elected that country is known as republic fine so there is much elaboration of these concepts which i won't be getting in here i only be telling you the important one liners which could make you identify these concepts when you are being given these concepts in the objective questions fine so these are the four or other words coming to the sovereign word if i say india is a sovereign country what does it mean it means that india is a country which is free independent to take all its decision by its own it is not dependent on any other country or any other group or any other post outside the territory of the country for its internal or external decisions we are independent we are free we are self authorized we are self capable to take all our administrative decisions on our own and no one yes i repeat no one outside the country has the right to interfere in our internal decisions fine so such a country which is self capable self reliant in taking its decisions is known as a sovereign country that means it is not dependent on any other country and that is only reflected by the option d that it does not depends on any other country fine so sovereign words meaning is option d so the correct answer is Let's move on to the next question. Question number five. Which among the following is not the feature of union government? So actually, the features which are displayed in the options are the features of the constitution. Uh, in the question, it has been a bit twisted, but actually, it is indirectly asking you the important features of the constitution only. So if we have dealt with the basic of the constitution, that what constitution is and what are the important features of the constitution, you will get the answer. supremacy of constitution independent judiciary bicameral legislation or rigid constitution which is not a feature discussed which is not a feature supremacy of constitution is there a supremacy of constitution in a country yes there is just because there is rule of law just because there is a written constitution so like all the other countries where there is a rule of law the written constitution especially the written constitution the constitution over there is always supreme there is no one i repeat there is no one above the constitution in a country so there is this element of supremacy of constitution so this is not a wrong statement this is a correct element independent judiciary although there is an overlapping between the functions of the executive and legislative in a country but the judiciary in a country is completely independent 
we have an independent judiciary like that of United States of America. Fine. So this is also a correct statement. Coming to the next one, bicameral legislation. Yes. If we talk about the union government, union government or the union house of legislation, it is bicameral in nature. There is a lower house which we call as Lok Sabha. There is an upper house which we call as Rajya Sabha. So it is bicameral. Bicameral is also true. Rigid constitution. Is it true? Is our constitution rigid? No. It is a wrong statement and as it is asked, which is not the feature, this is the correct answer. The statement is wrong and hence the answer is correct. Fine. Why this answer is correct and why this statement is wrong? Because ours is not a rigid constitution. Ours is a blend of rigidity and flexibility. Rigidity and flexibility. Just because Indian constitution is prone to amendments, we cannot say that ours is a rigid constitution. A rigid constitution is one in which the process of amendment is either not possible or if it is possible also, it is very complex like that of American constitution. American constitution is a rigid constitution because amendment in that constitution is a very tedious, is a very herculean, is a very complex process. Fine. So this rigidity and flexibility feature is directly related to the amendment of the constitution. In India, although we have a written constitution, but amendments can be done. Fine. And that too in a variety of process. There are few provisions which can be amended with a simple majority. There are other such provisions which can be amended by a two-third or the absolute majority and there are few such other provisions which cannot be amended at all. Like the element of supremacy of the constitution or rule of law. These elements of the constitution cannot be amended. So, our constitution despite being written is neither completely flexible nor it is rigid. It is a blend. Just because few provisions are there, few provisions exist which cannot be amended, we can call it a partly rigid constitution. But there are other elements which can be amended easily, therefore we call it as flexible also. So on and all, it is a blend of rigidity and flexibility. Fine. So the answer will be D. It is not a rigid constitution. Fine. Coming to question number 6. Again, it is a match the following question. And uh, this question is from the section of sources of the constitution. In the very basic factual part of the constitution, you might have memorized the schedules, parts and also the sources. We all know as one of the uh, features of the constitution that our constitution has been adopted from various constitutions of the world. Ours is not an original constitution with all the, with all the original concepts. Therefore, you might have heard this that our constitution is also known as a copy paste constitution. But there are again many defenders who defend this concept. So finally, uh, we know that many provisions of our constitution has been taken from various constitutions of the world. Although most of the constitution's provisions have been adopted from the government of India at 1935, the internal source of the constitution, while others are adopted from many other countries. And after 1935, Britain's constitution has most influence on our constitution's provisions. So the question is taken from that there only that which provision is taken from which country. Let us see at the question. Fundamental rights, parliamentary system of government, emergency provisions, directive principles of state policy. So fundamental rights from where has been taken? It has been taken from the United States of America, USA. If the uh, correct matching for fundamental rights is true, so the answer is either B or C. Fine, B or C. Let's look at the second one, parliamentary system for government 1. So 1, C. The alignment is disturbed. So for B, if it is 1, then the answer should be C. For A, it is 2. For B, it is 1. For C, it is 4. And for D, it is 3. Let's look. Emergency provision 4, yes. And there is principle 3, yes. So the answer is C. Fine. Uh, while you are noting down this question, do make the correct alignment which has which is disturbed a bit here. So the answer is C2143. Like these provisions, also memorize other sources of the constitution the way I told you. Fine. 
Let us now move on to the next question, question number 7. Which of the following statements related to the preamble is true? It is directly mentioned here that the question is from the preamble. Preamble is amendable, it has been amended twice. It mentions the objectives of constitution, it has been adopted from the island. So, we, you need to identify the true statements. Fine. Firstly, carefully read out the question, what it is asking. Then go through the options. It is asking you to pick the true statements. So, preamble is amendable. Is it true or false? It is true. After especially the Keshav Nanda Bharti case of 1973, the Supreme Court uh, told that preamble is, as it has been mentioned, is the key of the constitution. It is a part of the constitution and is not only amendable, it is also enforceable. So after 1973, it is evident, it is confirmed that preamble can be changed, preamble can be enforced. Fine. Amendment can be done in preamble. So this statement is true. It has been amended twice. Is this statement true? No, it is wrong. Because preamble has been amended only once and that is by the 42nd amendment 1976. By this amendment many changes were done in our constitution and one of those changes was adding three new words to the preamble and that is socialist secular in integrity integrity right these three words were added to the preamble by this amendment and this was the only amendment done in the preamble so far so the statement number two is wrong because it hasn't been amended twice it has been amended only once fine now let's look at the third statement it mentions the objectives of the constitution is it true or false it is true. Actually, the entire text of preamble mentions mainly four things. The text of the preamble mentions four things. Firstly, the source of authority. Source of authority. That means who authorizes the constitution that it will be uh, considered supreme in the country, it will be followed in the country. Uh, it has been mentioned in the preamble's first line, we the people of India. We the common people of India are the source of authority of the constitution. So, this source of authority is mentioned in the text of preamble. Secondly, the preamble mentioned the nature of Indian state. Nature of India. I told you this in a question I dealt two, three questions back. Uh, that there are five such words which tell about the nature of India, sovereign, socialist and all. Thirdly, it tells about the objectives of the Indian constitution. Yes, it do tell about the main aims for writing down the constitution. The seven words which you see in the text of the preamble, equality, justice, liberty, fraternity, uh, integrity, unity, these seven words actually tell in the preamble that why the constitution has been written. It has been written so that justice can be ensured among in the society, so that there could be individual and social freedom, so that there could be equality amongst people in the society. So the main aim of writing down the constitution were these seven words. Fine. So preamble do tell about the aim of writing down the constitution. And the fourth is the date of adoption. Date. You all if have memorized the preamble text, you might be knowing that. Our uh, constitution was adopted on 26th of November 1949. And this date has been mentioned in the text of the preamble in the last paragraph. Fine. So these are the four things which the preamble exactly mentions in a sequence. So you can see the third one is the objective of the constitution. So it tells about the objective of the constitution. Therefore, the option number three is correct. Fine. Coming to the last statement, it has been adopted from Ireland. Is it true? No, it is not. It has been adopted from USA. Fine. So, only the option 1 and 3 are true and according to that, option number C is our answer. Because the true statement has been asked. So, 1 and 3 are true. C is the correct answer. Fine. Let us now move on to next question, question number 8. 
it is the following statements related to parts of constitution is not true now the question is from the part of the constitution i have dealt with the question related to schedule i have also dealt with the question related to sources of the constitution then constitution development preamble and only one topic was left and that was part a few statement again given and the question is not true you have to identify the incorrect statement let us check part 9b was added in 2005 is it true or false it is false part 9b it deals with cooperative societies fine you might have memorized all the 22 parts so in that part 9b deals with the cooperative societies and cooperative societies were added or were given the constitution recognition by the 97th amendment 2011 so part 9b was added in the constitution by 97th amendment 2011 and not in 2005 therefore the statement is incorrect second part 7 was deleted by 7th amendment is it true or false it is true yes part 7 actually it is a repealed or the deleted part now because it is written over here part 7 earlier to the prior to its deletion mentioned the important part b states actually it mentioned the important provisions laid down with laid down by the constitution for the part b states actually before the 7th amendment all the states of india were categorized in four categories part a states part b states part c and part d states fine but by the 7th amendment the state reorganization act came and all the states in india were reorganized on the on the linguistic basis fine on the basis of the language so that part a part b part c part d all these categories of states were dissolved and the categorization was purely on the basis of language so if there was no part b state so the importance of part 7 part 7 of the constitution was no more hence that part 7 was deleted by the 7th amendment do you remember that this 7th amendment took place in the year 1956 this is the year when the state reorganization act came and states were reorganized on the basis of language on the linguistic basis fine so it deleted the part 7 the provisions related to part b states fine coming to the statement number 3 Part four was added by forty fourth amendment. Is it true? Was it added by the forty fourth amendment? What is part four a? It is fundamental duty. By which amendment was it added? It was added by forty second amendment and not forty fourth amendment. So this statement is wrong. Forty second amendment included the list of fundamental duties in our constitution and not forty fourth amendment. so this statement is wrong coming to the fourth statement part 14a was added by 42nd amendment what is part 14a it is tribunals tribunal the part mentioning the tribunals was also added later in the constitution by this amendment only 42nd amendment 1976 tribunal means it is a semi judicial body wherein the judges are not from the judicial background they are from administrative background so this the recognition of tribunal the constitution recognition of tribunal was done in the year 1976 by this amendment and was added in the part 14a so in this way this statement number 4 is correct so we have got all the analysis part statement number 1 is wrong statement number 2 is correct statement number 3 is wrong statement number 4 is correct so again you have to identify what not true which of the followings are not true so one is not true and three is not true again the answer is c one and three fine so answer is c let us let us move on to the next question question number 9 one may ask that there might be something new in the constitution made in the history of this world it's been over a 100 years since the world's first written constitution was written whose statement was this regarding criticism of the constitution was it mahatma gandhi pandit jawahar lal nehru ambedkar or rajin prasad was the correct answer answer is dr bhim rao ambedkar actually when people were criticizing india's constitution as a copy paste constitution 
they were calling it is a hodgepodge constitution because many of the provisions for constitution were adopted from many constitutions of the world as i said a uh, few few moments back so that's why many critics criticized it as a hodgepodge constitution so in defense of the constitution bir ambedkar released this statement fine in defense of the constitution or that feature of the adoption of provision from various countries bir ambedkar released this statement fine so answer is bir ambedkar coming to the last question of today's session Question number ten: How many sections and schedules were there in the Government of India Act, nineteen thirty-five? It is again a question from the development of the Constitution or the historical background of the Constitution. It is a directly factual question. We all know the largest of all the acts which came to India was the Government of India Act, nineteen thirty-five, and this act had many sections and many schedules. So you have to choose whenever you study about the 1935 Act, you need to know that how many sections it included and how many schedules it included. So what is the correct answer? Answer is A. It had 321 sections and 10 schedules. Do remember because it was an Act, it had sections and not articles. And in the question, it is not asked that there how many articles and schedules are there in our Constitution. It is asked. in the 1935 act fine so because it is an act there are sections and there are schedules as there is in all the acts and regulations fine so answer is a 321 and 10 schedules fine so that is all for today's session we did 10 questions but uh, while explaining these 10 questions i had explained you enough of stuff which would which could benefit you in solving other questions related to that topic go through these topics once again because i'll be coming with a live session after three episodes in which i'll be again touching these topics and i'll be bringing few other questions in which you have to answer me live fine so get ready for the live question go through these questions also and go through the topics which have been covered in today's and next two ftr sessions also because the question in the fourth live session will not only be based from the miscellaneous topics they'll also be based in the, the topics in which i have already dealt in these three episodes fine so do remember do not forget to participate in the live session which will be the fourth session of the polity you can have a look at this schedule for the date on which the live session will be held where you can answer me live fine so that is it for today's ftr do not forget to watch the next episode of the ftr tomorrow sharp at 6 pm on the competition committee's english medium youtube channel and tomorrow at 8 am you will be provided with the ftr of chatisgarh gs so don't forget to tune in thank you so much सीजीपीएससी की संपूर्ण तैयारी के लिए कंपटीशन कम्युनिटी के यूट्यूब चैनल को सब्सक्राइब कीजिए और डेली अपडेट्स के लिए बेल आइकन को प्रेस करना ना भूलें